Wow, a nice intimate class. How nice. Why doesn't someone tear out a sheet of paper from a notebook if you have one? And we can take a special attendance roster. You will all get your exam scores first. That, I promise you. Um, all right, I'm going to pass around some battle maps here. Please enjoy them. I will try to make this all clear as we go along. I know it looks like a lot of information. Come, 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 come. Hide. Anyone else coming? No. No. Okay. Well, we come now to. We come now to the climax of the term, one of my favorite subjects, one of my favorite lectures, in fact, uh, the Ottoman entry into the First World War. If the outbreak of the First World War was, as Churchill called it, a drama unsurpassed, well, I'm not sure if that's true. This drama might even surpass it. If you look at the story and all of its implications, not just obviously for the history of modern Turkey, as we know the entry of the Ottoman Empire into the war leads eventually to the breakup of the empire, the creation of the Turkish Republic along with all of the successor states. I mean, all of that is pretty obvious. But of course, if we look at something like the rather explosive history of the modern Middle East, um, relations between obviously the Islamic world and the West, the Russian Revolution, the collapse of Russia and its war effort, a whole lot of the history of the 20th century goes back to this specific decision, that is, the Ottoman decision to enter the war. Um, of course, you could say the same thing for the outbreak of the war, but once the war began, in some ways, this was the key question. My own view is that in one form or another, the Ottomans would have eventually entered the war, whether of their own volition or not of their own volition, that in a certain sense, the First World War was about the Ottoman Empire. That said, it didn't have to happen the way that it did. The way that it did happen was actually pretty remarkable. One of the things you have to keep in mind during all of what follows is that while public opinion was by no means the deciding factor, the cabinet struggle inside the Ottoman government was highly significant. Um, just to sum up, I suppose, in the most general sense, you know, we have, I didn't even write Javid's name. I'll spell it in the Turkish way with the J. Um, Javid Bey, the finance minister, and Said Halim Pasha, who is both foreign minister and essentially prime minister, although as we usually put it in shorthand grand vizier, this is sort of the, uh, the traditional shorthand, even though the office did not exist in the same way. Essentially, you could call him the prime minister or grand vizier, Javid Bey, the finance minister. Both of them, for their own reasons, were hesitant to enter the war and probably would have preferred in their heart of hearts for Turkey to remain neutral, in part so that they could keep negotiating good deals with the other powers. We know, of course, that Enver Pasha was more or less the gung-ho pro-German who wanted to enter the war, although the extent of his Germanophilia has often been exaggerated. Jamal was not really that well understood, I think, until recently, quite how crucial his own role was. Talat, it's funny because some accounts have Talat being in the war camp, some having him not being in the war camp, which is, I think, probably pretty accurate. He sort of wavered. You know, he had a foot in both camps. He was not really firmly in the war camp, although eventually he joined the war camp. Um, but so here's the thing. Part of the drama of all of the, the events that I'm going to cover basically comes down to this. It's kind of like, who has the strongest voice in the cabinet? Who controls the Ottoman government? In the end, it may not have been any one man's control, or even two man's, or three man's, or four man's. There were other characters as well. I mean, Halil Bey, in a way, he's kind of speaker of the chamber. He has a certain role to play because he represents, you know, the most important factions in parliament. But for the most part, really, it is Enver Pasha, the war minister, Jamal, minister of marine, or the naval minister, along with Talat, interior minister, Said Halim Pasha. They're the most important characters, slightly more so than Javid. And so in the end, they're the ones really making the decisions. I mean, this was really true in most of the other European countries, too. Despite the kind of popular account, it's more of a revisionist account, but the idea that public opinion really did matter. 
Yes, to some extent, it helped inform the decisions made by the men in power. And this was true in Berlin and Vienna as well. But in the end, the decisions were not made by the public. The decisions were made in secret, in secret conclaves of government ministers. Um, in fact, some of the key decisions were actually not even made by Turks. They were made by this guy, the German Admiral Wilhelm Sushon. But I'll get to him in a moment. Just to lay the background, you have the basics from the other day about how the war began in Europe. A lot of the background to the war was, as I have said, to do with the Balkan Wars, to do with the Ottoman Empire. But of course, the Balkan states did not this time drive the war as they did 1912, 1913. Nor did Turkey, at least in a direct sense. However, particularly for the Russians, the whole Ottoman question was paramount. I talked especially about the issues of the dreadnoughts, the issues of warships, the issues of the straits. Little known aspect actually of the last week of July is that the Russians asked desperately for the British to block delivery of the two Ottoman warships. We usually call it in English Rishadye, although the actual, it's funny because the textbooks often get this wrong. Um, it was actually, of course, named after Mehmed Rashad V, renamed. Originally, it was being built for one of the South American countries, I think for Argentina. But anyway, the Russians actually asked on the 31st of July, basically the very day when the German ultimatum landed and Russia's mobilization began, they asked very urgently for the British to impound these two ships. Little did they know that, in fact, the British were about to do that anyway for their own reasons. The British always did everything for their own reasons. They never really did it for anyone else's reasons. But to go back a little bit in time, the Ottoman position, again, was delicate. The Ottomans were pretty isolated following the Balkan Wars. I talked about how the German relationship with the Ottomans, which had been very close in the Hamidian era, partly because of the relationship between the Kaiser and the Sultan, it was now, it's not completely ruined, but it was not anything like what it was. The Germans, remember, had not helped Turkey during the Balkan Wars. You know, they had not helped Turkey even when the Austrians annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina. The Germans, in fact, to a certain extent, were kind of on the Greek side, at least to the extent that the Kaiser, remember, had this relationship with his sister, basically, was Queen of Greece. Um, the Albanian question after the Balkan Wars, the Germans actually were not on the Turkish side. In fact, oddly enough, the Russians were supporting Turkish control over Albania, because the Russians, remember, although they kind of, sort of support the Serbs and Bulgars, they don't really want them to get too big. So they did not want Serbia to have access to the Adriatic coastline. And the Germans actually did not want the Ottomans to have Albania. So there were reasons then that the Turks no longer fully trusted the Germans. But the Turks desperately wanted an ally. They thought that they needed an ally. They thought they needed protection. And amazingly, they actually asked all of the powers in turn. Um, they had asked Britain on several occasions. The British kept saying no. The British, again, it's not that the British were anti-Turkish. It's kind of almost like they were just almost indifferent by this point. They weren't paying attention. Turkey just didn't register for them. I'll give you very strong evidence of that in a few moments. But it just it wasn't a priority for the British. Sure, they worried about Egypt. But Turkey was seen as kind of like this dying empire that didn't matter very much in London. They just weren't paying very close attention anymore. So the British say no out of kind of indifference. The French are intrigued. The French position is a bit odd because France, ironically, although we know that the French will eventually team up with the other powers to carve up the Ottoman Empire, the start of the war, the French do not want that to happen. France is actually the leading bond holder in the Ottoman Empire. That is, the French hold the majority of Ottoman debt. And so the French, they kind of want the Ottoman Empire to keep, again, you know, remaining to continue on, but they're not willing to go so far as to sign any kind of an alliance treaty. The Russians, oddly enough, the Russians, actually it's Talat who proposes this of all people. He proposes an alliance with the Russians. He goes to visit the Tsar at Levadia and the Krim and the Crimea. This is in May of 1914. I, it might have just been one of those cynical trial balloon things. But the Russians, they kind of said, hmm, that's interesting. No thanks. So in the end, they were left with nobody but the Germans. Again, it was not that they were real excited about the Germans. They were kind of a little pissed off about the way the Germans had treated Turkey lately. But by the time the July crisis happens, for lack of better options, the Turks are back petitioning the Germans for an alliance. However, the Germans, too, said no. The ambassador, Hans von Wagenheim, 
Now he himself, he was very different from the previous ambassador. The ambassador back in like the happy era, the Hamidian era, had been uh, Marshal von Bieberstein, and he was very pro-Turkish, very pro-Ottoman. Uh, he was kind of the embodiment of the era in a way. Wangenheim he wasn't really like that. He was not a great champion of the Turkish cause. That said, he was an admirer of his emperor, and he had ambitions for the chancellery. That is, he wanted to be chancellor, and so when the Kaiser leaned on him heavily and said, no, I want you to start talks again, he did that. This is the first time when the Kaiser intervenes. The Kaiser himself, Emperor Wilhelm II, says you have to start talks again with the Turks. And this is partly because the Kaiser, remember, had this romantic notion of you know, Islam and Turkey and all of this. He kind of remembered his earlier enthusiasm for the Turks. He was also beginning to worry that Germany was isolated. And to a certain extent, the Ottomans they offered some real potential to the Germans if there were a European war. In some ways, they could do more than the Austrians could. Why? Well, because Turkey bordered Russia at numerous places, particularly in the Caucasus. Turkey also, because theoretically Egypt was still Ottoman, even though the British controlled it, Turkey could maybe knock the British out of Egypt. There were many strategic areas in which Turkey could offer the Germans something. Um, so the Germans, they restart the negotiations. People view it differently. The Kaiser, again, he's got this kind of uh, Turkophilia. You know, he's very fond of Turkey and the Ottomans. The generals, they're more skeptical. They don't really think that the Turkish army amounts to much anymore. Turkey, remember, had been routed in the Balkan Wars. They hadn't done very well. So it's not entirely clear that the Germans are necessarily going to push this alliance seriously. But the Kaiser says you have to start talks again. So they're talking, talk, 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 talk. Nothing's happening. Meanwhile, back in London, a behind the scenes drama is beginning to ensue. This is partly because the British, they're not quite clear yet if there's gonna be a war. Churchill though, and this is probably Churchill, we know him more from the Second World War than the first, although I guess in Turkey you know him because of Chanakale and Gallipoli. Um, in America, he's mostly known, of course, for his role in the Second World War. But actually, in 1914, in some ways, his role was even more controversial and dynamic than it would be in 1939. And that's because he was first Lord of the Admiralty, which is, although he was a civilian, he was essentially the highest ranking, or at least the ranking member of the Navy. That is, he gave orders to everybody else. Sometimes it was ambiguous, though, because he was a civilian like a lot of the admirals would try to overrule him and technically they, they could kind of like overawe the cabinet. But anyway, Churchill, he's very young. I mean, he's only like 43 or something. So a lot of the admirals also think he's like young and he's uppity and he's obnoxious and they don't trust him. But the thing about Churchill is he had guts. Now he had cojones, as the Mexicans like to say. He would often do things without getting the permission or the approval of the other admirals. And in fact, the first thing he did, the most, I think, in some ways important thing in this whole crisis, is that Churchill himself proposed, again, taking over these two Ottoman dreadnoughts. The Sultan Osman I and the Rashadier, as it's usually called in English, or the Rashad V, the Rashad V. The Sultan Osman I, as I think I may have mentioned, was actually at this stage the most powerful warship ever built. It mounted 13 and a half inch guns. This is the ship the Russians were terrified of because as soon as the Ottomans floated this ship in the Boaz, in the Bosporus, Russia could pretty much kiss its dreams of controlling the Straits. Goodbye, sayonara. Good night. This is why the Russians desperately asked the British, actually on the 31st of July, not to send the ships to Turkey. Little did they know that Churchill was already planning to do this for his own reasons. Now it's curious because it became really controversial after the fact. Like once Turkey was in the war, a lot of people in Britain blamed Churchill because they said, well, you, you stole their warships and that you know, made them angry, so it's all your fault. And so Churchill later on concocted this story about how, well, it wasn't really me. You know, we had this procedure in place in case of war. We would impound foreign warships. It was a lie. There was no procedure in place. Churchill just did it on his own. Like, literally, he just decided on his own, little brainstorm thought bubble, I'm going to impound these ships. Well, you can see why he would. It's not that it was, like, anti-Turkish. He just thought, look, this war could be over in a couple of months. Everyone thought that. It could be really close. 
And if we have the most powerful warship in the world and one of the top five warships in the world, that could make a material difference. You know, he just thought, look, basically, we need these dreadnoughts. And we will consider either you know, paying the Turks back for them after the war or maybe even letting the Turks have them without you know, finishing the payment. The Turks later claimed that they had paid for them in full, which was not true. You know, they'd only paid for about a third of both of the ships. And some people were saying, like, maybe, okay, we'll let the Turks have them after the war, but we won't make them pay the full price. They're considering, you know, this or that. But it's true. The way he did it was very, you know, deeply insensitive, and he did not ask permission. He just sort of impounded them. Uh, now, it's true. They had to actually meet with the cabinet. The cabinet did not actually approve this action until the 31st of July when they actually started that as British crews boarded the ships, which was very significant because if the Ottomans had quote unquote run the colors, that is, you know, raised the flag, if they had put up the Ottoman flag, then technically under international law, Britain would not have been able to do what it did. It would have been a more serious violation. But the British did this fairly quickly. The other issue, of course, was that the Ottomans didn't really have enough trained personnel who would have been able to run the ships. You know, they needed British help because they needed the British to train them. And so the British kind of knew that. So they kind of knew that the Ottomans probably would not be as bold as they would. So instead, the British boarded the ships and just essentially impounded them and declared they are now British ships. They didn't declare this publicly. It was done very quietly, which is significant because the next key date, this happens on the 31st of July, which is, again, against this backdrop, really dramatic stuff happening. You know, uh, the Russians are mobilizing the German ultimatum to Russia. The, the World War is about to begin. This is the day when they approve this, when they board the ships. Now, we think there is evidence that the Turks actually started to protest this quietly on the 1st of August. So on the 1st of August, you have a couple of things happening. Turkey first discovers that Britain has impounded the Turkish dreadnoughts. Now, meanwhile, communication between Berlin and Istanbul, Constantinople, the Chancellor Bethmann sends instructions to his ambassador that he is not supposed to sign a treaty of alliance with Turkey unless Turkey can offer something tangible, concrete, something real, something, quote, worthy of the name in the war effort against Russia. That is, we're not just going to give them an alliance treaty. They have to offer us something. Interesting, because on that very day, in Verpasha, goes to Wangenheim at the German embassy, and he says, we will give you the Sultan Osman I. That is, we will give you the most powerful warship ever built. That is our contribution to the common war effort against Russia. That's what Inver tells Wangenheim. Very interesting. Because earlier that very day, the Turkish government had learned that the British had boarded the Sultan Osman I. You see what I'm getting at here? And there tricked the Germans. <laughs> he offered them something which was no longer his to give, which cost him nothing because it was already basically taken over by the British. And the Germans used this as essentially evidence to justify the signing of the Ottoman-German Alliance Treaty of the 2nd of August 1914. A treaty which was very carefully worded by the Ottomans, the Turks wrote the terms, to say, let's see if I can get the wording exactly right, that, um, that the Ottomans would join the war against Russia if Germany entered such a war according to the terms of its own treaty with Austria. Which again, sounds convoluted diplomatic language. The upshot of it, though, was that the Turks knew that Germany had declared war unprovoked on Russia. That is, they had not done so by invoking the terms of their treaty with Austria. So technically speaking, this did not oblige Turkey to fight. So in two days, they have now won a couple of coups against the Germans. It's very interesting because, again, the whole traditional account of the war is the Germans pushed the Turks into it. Uh, it's not really true. In fact, the alliance treaty was signed at Turkish insistence and with deception. The Germans essentially gave the Ottoman Empire a guarantee of its territorial integrity, you know, guarantee of support. You know, in the case of the war, they will help Turkey obviously regain lost territories, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, in exchange for essentially nothing because Turkey has not entered the war against Russia. So the Turks have tricked the Germans and they have won a significant diplomatic triumph. The Germans are a little bit perturbed. 
But meanwhile, they don't get too angry at first because a drama is building, and this is where your maps come in. A drama is building in the Mediterranean, which is truly extraordinary. Uh, I hope you've, have any of you read the chapter yet? The Gerben and Enemy Then Flying, you've read some of it. So you have to follow the chronology very closely because a lot of this takes, everything's taking place kind of at the same time. But you have to kind of take everything in its turn because it is extraordinary. Basically, the Germans don't have a lot of ships in the Mediterranean. They have the SMS Gerben and the SMS Breslau, along with a couple of support ships and civilian ships. Now, the Gerben is kind of just borderline dreadnought class. It's not really a, it's nowhere near the Sultan Osman I in terms of the size of its guns or its range. It makes something like uh, 24 knots, which is pretty fast. It has, I think, were they 11 and a half inch guns? I think it's 11 and a half inch guns. Anyway, it's a dreadnought, but just barely. You know, it is a significant battleship, that is. On the other hand, the British have like a half dozen dreadnoughts in the Mediterranean. The French have a couple. So basically, it's going to get blown out of the water pretty soon. <laughs> it's going to get surrounded. And so the question is, what is Souchon going to do, the admiral commanding these ships? Well, the Germans had an idea that he could maybe go to Constantinople, to Istanbul, to maybe put some pressure on the Turks. Remember, the Turks have not entered the war yet, and the Germans want them to. On the other hand, he could also try to make a dash for the Atlantic Ocean, past Gibraltar, or he could sort of take the coward's option, and he could go up the Adriatic to Pola, which is the base of the Austrian Navy. That's another option. That's like if he doesn't want to fight, if he just wants to hold up. The Austrians have like a bunch of old rusting, cruddy battleships who are probably just going to sit in port the whole time. They've got the port fortified, so probably nobody's going to attack it. They're just going to like sit there the whole war. So if Souchon wants to just kind of be passive, that's what he's going to do. Now, Souchon, initially, there are a few things he can do, though, at least to affect the mobilization of the Western Front. Basically, the French have all these troops they're trying to bring in, you know, from North Africa, from Algeria. And so the first thing he does on the 3rd of August, he has to wait until the 3rd of August. You have to remember these dates. The 3rd of August is when France declares war. Or I guess technically Germany declares war on France, followed by France. Anyway, so France enters the war on the 3rd of August. So that means Souchon can you know, legally as a combatant go and shell these French ports, which he does. Now this is very interesting because on the way there, he actually encounters the British fleet, or a large portion of the British fleet, who have several dreadnoughts, and could have very easily blown him out of the water, except that Britain was not yet at war with Germany. Because Britain is trying to wait to see what the Germans are going to do about invading Belgium, if you remember from the Schlieffen Plan. They think the Germans have probably already violated the border, but they're not sure. They want to send an ultimatum. They want to make sure everything is clear diplomatically. So anyway, so. The dreadnoughts literally just sort of pass each other, you know, and they salute in the traditional way you do in peacetime. And they don't fire, because they're not at war. Well, interestingly, his ships go back the direction that they came right after doing this. And on the 4th of August, yet again, they pass the British fleet. The 4th of August, this is the day of the British ultimatum. That is, the Germans are supposed to evacuate Belgium you know, they, they know the Germans aren't going to do this, but they want to at least give the Germans a kind of time window. This is mostly to prepare the British public for war by saying, look, we gave them time. You know, they didn't listen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they encounter them again, and yet again, they cannot engage. This time, though, it's more interesting, because the clock is literally ticking. You remember the scene in the movie we watched, Master and Commander, where they're like trying to escape into the fog. Like That's literally what's happening here. They're waiting for the ultimatum to expire. And the British want to make sure they're still in range when the ultimatum expires so they can fire. The Germans are racing for Sicily. Because Sicily, part of Italy, which is still neutral, means the Germans can dock in a neutral port where they will not be able to be fired upon. So it's literally a race across the Mediterranean. A race Souchon wins by just several hours. And then he holds up at Messina, which you can see here on your map basically in this, the tip of Sicily kind of facing the boot of Italy. 
Well, here there is some real drama, in part because according to the laws of war, you're only allowed to dock for 24 hours for one day, that is, in a neutral port. Which is not really enough time for Sushon, because he wants to go from here all the way to here, and he needs coal. He needs a lot of coal. A lot more coal than you can probably load in 24 hours. And so his men, I mean, they literally rip up the whole of the ship to try to fit more coal in the cargo holds. And the men are like working. This is Sicily. This is Sicily in August. It is like frighteningly hot, you know. They're sweating. A couple of men actually die of heat exhaustion in the middle of this. And they work until they literally cannot work anymore. They all collapse in the tarmac. And so Sean orders up a round of beer for everybody. You know, and finally says, okay. You know, we have to go. He thinks they're probably about to die because, after all, the British know that they're there. And the Straits of Messina, as you can see, they're actually pretty narrow. You've got an exit here and an exit here. And so Sean figures the British are going to be guarding both exits. But as it turns out, they're not. They're only guarding this exit. They're only guarding the north or the, I guess we could call it, the west exit. Because they think, they think Sushon is going to try to make it to the Atlantic. The idea doesn't even occur to them that he might be going to Turkey. Remember how I talked about how Britain is just, they're not even like paying attention to Turkey. It's not even on their radar. The idea just doesn't occur to them. So they don't guard the exit. So he escapes. Third time, that is, that Sushon escapes. Okay, now the fourth time is a little more ambiguous. The British do actually finally engage, very briefly, that is, they fire. Uh, you can see this on the map where the Gloucester, this is uh, His Majesty's ship HMS Gloucester, engages the Breslau, not the Gerben, which was a dreadnought. This is like the cruiser, the smaller ship. Um, and what's interesting about this battle is that these readings that, that you have, they're all by Barbara Tuckman. She actually witnessed this battle when she was a six-year-old girl. <laughs> what, what was she doing in the Eastern Mediterranean, you're wondering? Well, her father was Henry Morgenthau, the rather notorious American ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. You know, the same who's notorious in part because of the Armenian controversy. She was actually on her way just to visit, essentially, her grand... Oh, did I say father? Sorry, grandfather. Um, well, anyway, she actually witnessed the battle as a six-year-old girl. She was called in to the American embassy to debrief Wangenheim on the battle as a six-year-old girl. And then 50 years later, she wrote a best-selling book about it, which I think is pretty cool. So she witnesses the battle. What happened? Well, basically, the British had a chance, the fourth chance now to blow the German ship out of the water. And they blew it again. This time because the commander said, well, I didn't think I had superior force. It's ambiguous whether or not he did. The Gerben was dreadnought class. It did have substantial range. It was ambiguous. He basically made a coward's decision not to engage. He let them go. Okay, so now what happens? They hole up here, you know, essentially in the Aegean. You can see this island of Denusa. The British, by this point, though, have finally figured out what's going on, and they finally figure out where he's going, and so they're chasing him. So they hole up. They literally go into hiding. They, they, they uh, basically have radio silence because they don't want the British to know where they are. While everyone is waiting to see what's going to happen, Said Halim Pasha, the Grand Vizier slash Prime Minister slash Foreign Minister, he decides to dictate terms to the Germans. Remember how I said the Ottomans are the ones telling the Germans what, what's what. This time they literally do it. They say, we will not let your ships in. That is through Chanakale, which is mine. We will not let your ships in unless you not only promise this, 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 and this. This time they're very explicit about what territories they want back in the war. They're very explicit that Germany must guarantee you know, Ottoman territory after the war. And that the Germans must accept the abolition of the capitulations. This, remember, was the key political issue, right? The whole issue of extraterritoriality, also the, the right to collect tolls, taxes, etc. The Germans basically have to agree to this, you might say, at gunpoint. Because after all, Sushon and his Gerben are going to be blown out of the water if they are not allowed in. It's just a matter of time now. The whole British Navy is looking for them. So there's a lot of drama. You know, he's holed up in the island, radio silence. He dispatches a small you know, commerce ship to Izmir, to Smyrna, to send a wireless message asking for permission. He waits, and then at the last minute, you know, he overhears the signals of the British squadron as they're coming to get him. Permission is wired. Supposedly, actually, by Inver, although it should have been Jamal. 
in Vera's war minister did control the Strait's defenses. So, these ships enter the waters of the Sea of Marmara, actually, it's on the 10th to 11th of August, 1914. Why does this matter? Well, first of all, because it's a violation of the laws of neutrality, obviously. As I said, 24 hours, you're allowed to dock, but they're obviously going to stay longer than 24 hours. And that 24 hours, the first 24 hours is actually very significant, because although it wasn't generally known at the time, the Russians had orders to engage. That is, the Russians had orders to go into the Boaz and blow the German ships out of the water. Because from Russia's perspective, you remember how terrified they were of the Sultan Osman I. Well, they no longer have to worry about this, right? Because Churchill impounded it. But now you have another dreadnought-class battleship, which can essentially take over the Black Sea. It's not that one ship can be everywhere at once. It's that because of its speed, superior to any other ship in the Black Sea, and the range of its guns, it essentially renders the Russian fleet obsolete. The Russians can no longer basically mount any kind of offensive operation against the Bosporus. At least that's the way they see it. So to them, basically, they want Turkey either to expel the ship, you know, to, to get rid of the Germans controlling it, or they are going to go in and they are going to fire. It is a violation of the laws of neutrality, which very nearly brought the Ottomans into the war in August. The reason it didn't was because of yet another ingenious decision by Said Halim Pasha, who I have to tell you was a lot cleverer than Enver was. It was Said Halim who insisted on you know, abolition of the capitulations, and this time it was Said Halim who came up with the idea of purchasing these ships, the Gerben and the Breslau, to replace the two British dreadnoughts. And so they purchased them for 80 million German gold marks, except that no money actually changed hands. <laughs> what they did is they renamed them the Yavus and the Midili, and they told the German crews to put on their fezes <laughs> and run up the Ottoman colors, which they did. So they're now no longer German ships. Now they are Ottoman ships. Although the Germans, uh, as this story goes, to sort of uh, tease the Russians, they would dock in front of the Russian embassy. And then they would take off their fezes and put the German caps back on and sing a few bars of Die Wacht am Rhein and Deutschland über alles, <laughs> just to sort of uh, tease the Russians, sort of like putting up the middle finger at the Russians. But now, theoretically at least, they're Ottoman ships. And so it's no longer a violation of the laws of neutrality. I mean, obviously it still is. And so all of the ambassadors, you know, Britain, France, Russia, they all demand, obviously, you have to expel the German crews. There's also, of course, the mission of Liman von Sanders, the army mission, which is starting to mushroom in size. By, you know, September, October, they've got about 2,000 German officers in Turkey. So you now have two German warships docked, you know, under the Ottoman flag in apparent violation of the laws of neutrality. You have about 2,000 officers you know, the Germans who are now modernizing the defenses at Chanakale, they're training the Turkish army. The numbers are increasing every day. Uh, the Germans, as the phrase went, began sending away their wives. That is, so they could volunteer in the Ottoman army, that is, accepting commissions. But that said, interestingly, they still weren't at war. In fact, neutrality turned out to be a pretty effective policy. On the 8th of September, the port, the Ottoman Empire, simply declared all capitulations abolished forevermore. Now, what's interesting about this was that all of the ambassadors, including like the belligerent powers on opposite sides, you know, France and Germany are at war with one another, you know, Germany and Russia, Russia and Austria, they all got together, they actually issued a joint statement, all of them together, denouncing this. But then, of course, what could they do? Nothing. The capitulations were effectively abolished. Although, interestingly, the Germans protested too, so that, remember how they had theoretically accepted this back in August. They have now exposed the fact that they didn't really mean it. No. The Germans protest too. Now, it wasn't just a symbolic action. They, they literally did begin confiscating the diplomatic mails because all of the embassies ran their own post offices. And so they're starting to like read through the French mail now. And so they know about you know, like what the French are doing in Syria and the Arab nationalist movement, all this intelligence. You know, it is a very aggressive act. Um, the next aggressive act is when they literally close off the straits. That is Chanakali, and that's on the 27th of September. 
which is extremely significant for Russia, obviously, because Russia now, most of its kind of warm water ports that is in the Black Sea are cut off from world commerce. That issue, remember, was almost a casus belli for the Russians in the Balkan Wars. Well, now you have, you know, count them, one, two, three, maybe even four acts you could consider virtually acts of war against the Entente powers. But Turkey still doesn't declare war. The Germans, as you might imagine, are getting a little bit angry. <laughs> In fact, Liman, the head of the military mission, he's actually going around threatening, or I don't know if he was really serious about it, but he wants to have duels with all of the young Turks. <laughs> you stupid cowards who won't fight the Russians. You know, he threatens to have duels with Jamal in there. I mean, in there, it's not really his fault, because obviously he wants to go to war. Um, Inver does want to go to war, but Said Halim Pasha so far has outmaneuvered him. And neutrality seems to be paying off. It's going pretty well. They've abolished the capitulations, they've closed the straits, they have an alliance treaty with the Germans, the Germans have guaranteed their territory. Why mess with a good thing? Hmm. Well, you know, in September they very nearly did go to war. What happened was Inver teamed up with Sushon. And he told Sushon he was free to send his warships into the Black Sea. The implication being he could go attack the Russians. But Said Halim Pasha sniffed them out and he blocked them. So Enver started plotting. As I said, he got Halil Bey on his side. He got Jamal on his side. Talat, as I said, was kind of wavering. But here's what it basically came down to. They realized that the Grand Vizier and even the finance minister, Javid, and some of the other kind of committee members do not want to go to war. So they have to force the issue. How are they going to do it? Very simple, by attacking the Russians. And they now have the weapons to do it with. They have the two German ships, which they can use, particularly the dreadnought Gerben, which can attack the Russians with impunity. So they have to figure out how to do this, though. Obviously, they don't want to just do it without getting anything in return. They've done pretty well so far, negotiating with the Germans. And so they do some more hard bargaining. In early August, I'm sorry, in early October, they have a war council literally at the German embassy where they pretty much agree on the terms. The terms come down to something like this. Two shipments, German gold, one million pounds each, that is Brit British pounds. Doesn't sound like a lot today, like you know in the Austin Powers movie, one million dollars. But at the time, uh, two million pounds would be about 10 million US dollars. Uh, my rule of thumb is you multiply by about 100. You know, so, you know, you're talking about yeah, about a billion dollars in gold. Um, although actually these days inflation is getting so bad, I'd say you probably have to talk about five or 10 billion dollars in gold. Anyway, long story short, it's a lot of money. Um, they're also talking about a loan for another 5 million gold pounds. And they're also talking about a subsidy, monthly subsidy, of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 500,000 gold pounds. All of these are going to be the price of entry into the war. They asked, uh, it was an underling, actually a couple of years later in 1916, asked Talat, you know, why Turkey had gone into the war by which point it seemed like the war wasn't going well. You know, why did you throw in your lot with the Germans? And the answer was, Eilik um, Vermekicin, uh, by which he meant so we can pay everyone's salary. <laughs> that was at least one reason. Obviously, there were other motivations too. Revenge for the Balkan Wars, gaining territories back from Russia, and so on and so forth. Winning a real independence, abolishing the capitulations. There were many reasons for it. But these were the terms of entry. They literally said, we will not enter the war until the gold physically arrives in Constantinople. In two shipments sent by way of Romania, along with some hefty bribes <laughs> for the Romanians to allow them through, on the 17th and 21st of October 1911, the gold arrived. So you would have thought the Turks would have entered the war then. But no, they delayed a little bit further. Again, things have pretty much gone over into the war party, but Inver does not have the backing of Said Halim Pasha. He does not have the full backing of Talat. And so what he needs, he already has the gold, that's good, but what he basically needs is a fait accompli. That is, he needs to just make it happen. 
So how does he make it happen? In Ver and Sushon, along with Jamal's connivance, although the most of it was in Ver and Sushon, they together decide. They actually, what they do is they give Sushon like sealed orders in an envelope. Now, kind of, this is how, you know, wait until you're in the Black Sea before you open them. You know, here's a list of short targets to attack the Russians. Um, as Sushon put it, somewhat mischievously, he said something like, um, well, I will not prevent the guns from going off themselves if by some chance I happen upon the Russian fleet. Um, Sushon had also said, actually he said this in his memoirs, you know, a lot of this act had to do with this one single man, this German commander, because back when he was holed up in Sicily, his orders to go to Constantinople, to go to Istanbul, were actually rescinded. That is, the Germans told him, you can go where you want, it's up to you. You can go hole up in the Adriatic. And he said, he resolved in his own words to make a dash for Istanbul so he could force the Turks, quote, even against their will, to launch a war against their ancient enemy, that is, Russia. Well, it wasn't against the will of Inver, obviously. But it probably was against the will of at least some members of the Ottoman government. Inver gave Sushon his orders, which were open-ended. Sushon took them. On the 27th of October, they steamed out into the Black Sea. And within about a day and a half, they engaged the Russians in a number of cities, including Novorossiysk, Feodosia, Sevastopol, Odessa. They attacked the Russians. Now, this is all pretty well known. The part of the story that most people don't know is that the Russians actually knew all about this. Complicating the story at least slightly is the fact that the Russians knew all about the German gold shipments. You remember how I mentioned the other day in the context of the July crisis that the Russians had broken the Austrian diplomatic codes, cryptographers. So the Russians, because they were reading most of the correspondence of the Austrian ambassador, Pallavicini, they knew not absolutely everything, but they knew the vast majority of what was going on. They also had you know, spies inside the Ottoman government. And so they actually issued orders to their own fleet. Eberhardt, the commander, I think I wrote his name up here, uh, yeah, the commander of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, he actually received orders as early as October 21st to expect the Turkish attack as soon as the second gold shipment arrives. So you see, the Russians knew Sushon and the Turks were coming, which raises a very interesting question because you remember how a lot of the diplomacy in the end of July was about you know, who is made to look like the aggressor. The Russians mobilized first, but they made it clear to Britain, at least as the British saw it, that Germany was the aggressor. In this case, obviously the Russians want to make sure the Turks appear like the aggressor. And so they gave very clear orders to everyone not to fire first. So, Sushon and Inver cooked up the attack together in secret without the approval of the Ottoman government. But the Russians, in turn, knew it was coming. But the Russians very carefully, again, they did this very well both times. They did it at the end of July in deceiving the British about their early mobilization, as I talked about. And they did it again at the end of October when they made it perfectly clear to their commanders that they did not want them to fire first, just in case someone would witness it. Now, of course, Sushon complied. The Germans and the Ottomans fired first. And the key hits, of course, were scored, as we might expect, by the Gerben and the Breslau. Not least because they were both still crewed by Germans who actually knew what they were doing. Um, the Ottomans had a lot of ships of the pre-dreadnought class, you know, which did not have anywhere near the same capacity as the Gerben. And they also were not as adept at maneuvering the ships. And so the key strikes, most of the damage, like the blowing up of oil tanks and the sinking of ships, was achieved by these German ships. An act of war that is carried out in the name of the Ottoman Empire by Germans wearing Ottoman uniforms. <laughs> Which is very interesting. Yes, with the connivance of Inver Pasha, also Jamal, also probably Halil Bey, also possibly Talat, but definitely not Said Halim Pasha and definitely not Javid Bey. The government was not united. In fact, after the, the whole thing happens and the attack happened on the 29th of October, they get together for a crisis meeting on the 1st of November and both Said Halim Pasha and Javid Bey actually threatened to resign in protest. That to bring the government down in protest against the unprovoked attack against the Russians. 
They are both somehow prevailed upon not to resign, although eventually Jevy does resign. He resigns on the 5th of November, although eventually they bring him back because he's the only guy who understands the finances of the government, but he does resign. Said Halim Pasha, he's a little bit more mysterious. He's a little slipperier because the evidence about his real views is mixed. He would always tell you know, the French and British and Russian ambassador that he did not support the war. He wanted Turkey to stay out. On the other hand, he would tell the Austrians and the Germans that he wasn't really against the war. <laughs> so we don't know what his real views were. We do know he threatened to resign, and he insisted that the Ottomans send a note of apology to the Russians for attacking the Black Sea coast. We know that much. We also know, however, that he did not resign. And we also know that Inver insisted on inserting a little passage in the note of apology, blaming the Russians for provoking the attack. So they did send a note of apology, but it was kind of a cynical, contrived note that was designed to be rejected. Now on the Russian side, I don't think anyone was really terribly unhappy about this turn of events. The Russians wished that the Turks did not have the Gerben, because if they didn't, then Russia might have been able to attack the Bosporus right away. However, even so, Russia, its ultimate war aim, of course, was to conquer the Ottoman Empire. And so, basically, the Russian government was united. And if you look at the actual declaration of war, there's kind of like, it's almost like relief, you know, because the Russian public had no idea what the hell the Russians were doing, you know, fighting against the Germans and the Austrians, frankly. But a war against the Turks, well, that was pretty easy to explain, and vice versa. It was very easy to justify a war against Russia to the Ottoman public, to the Turkish public. I mean, this was the ancient enemy. The same thing on both sides. I mean, in a way, in the end, it was probably a war that both the Turks and the Russians wanted. I don't know if that's necessarily true of the British and the French, you know, who were definitely not gung-ho about the war at first. They got to be a little bit later. Um, but so anyway, the whole thing, as I said, was brought about by the willful decisions of a small handful of men without the slightest whisper of consulting the public or anything like that. This colossal decision from which so much history flows in the last years of the Ottoman Empire and the Middle East and even Russia, of course, because of the closing of straits to commerce. Uh, so that's all I had for today and uh, effectively the term. Thank you for coming. Uh, do we have the attendance sheet which was being passed around? No? We never did. Okay, well, let's, let's do that before we go. Uh, we can pass around. Just sign the back of this form. Um, so I will make sure that all of you get priority in the grading of exams for attending the last lecture of the term. Um, are there any questions about what we covered today before I get into the plan for next week? Okay. Um, next week will just be review. Now, I'm trying to remember the exam for this class is, I think, November the 4th. Is that right? Which is a Tuesday? I think. Yes, a Tuesday. Um, I mean, next week, honestly, I could do review, you know, any time, except that probably class time makes the most sense for most of you. So I can do it Tuesday, Friday, or both, or just one. Um, do all of you have a preference? Would you rather do both or just one? Or you know, would you rather wait until closer to the exam so you have more time to catch up on reading? Would you rather wait until Friday of next week? Or do Tuesday? Maybe Friday? Friday is also fairly close to the Tuesday final, so... Should we just do Friday review next week then? Yes. Friday. Okay, that's so you can have the whole week to kind of prepare, you know, come with questions. Yeah. Oh, and I will send a practice exam. I'll probably send it, um, you know, Monday or Tuesday. And then you can look over the practice exam and get ready for Friday. Okay? Yeah. As long as it takes. I, I doubt we'll be here for two whole hours. Um, as long as it takes, basically. Um, so no, I mean, I'll stay as long as people have questions. That's what review is for, for answering questions. Um,